Wave field tomography or wave field inversion aims to extract the physical properties information of our subsurface. And these physical properties could be compressional wave velocity, shear wave velocity, density, or any other model parameters you can imagine. So in this presentation, we are interested in inverting for the anisotropic parameters. And uh, in principle, this um, inversion, this in anisotropic inversion should be done through elastic uh, modeling. If we assume our, uh, assume our Earth is uh, elastic, but um, in this presentation, we are focused on the acoustic anisotropy because due to the cost of uh, um, the anisotropy elastic modeling. So, um, this is not new in literature. There are many researchers have attempted this uh, kind of inver inversions, but most of them focus on the single parameter inversion or sequential multi-parameter estimation. So here we focus on the simultaneous multi-parameter estimation. And um, to better folks uh, constrain the model parameters, uh, we will introduce a set of physics-based inequality model constraints. And we think this is quite new in literature. I haven't seen anyone have done that. So. Now let's first look at uh, our problem. This is the typical tomography problem posed as um, PDE constraint optimization. And we seek to find an optimal set of model parameters M such that uh, uh, to minimize the uh, cost function or the misfit function J of M. Um, meanwhile, our model parameters has to satisfy the physics or it has to follow the physics. In this case, is the wave equation F of M equals zero. In our case, uh, this F is the pseudo-acoustic wave equations. Now, there are a family of pseudo-acoustic wave equations and uh, all of them share the uh, same characteristic, they follow the uh, acoustic uh, anisotropy assumption, which is proposed by Tariq Al Khalifa in the late 1990s. So um, the one we use is the is uh, proposed by Robin Fletcher, Sean Du, and Paul Fuller uh, in their 2009 paper. This is called the um, pseudo acoustic wave equation. And uh, UP and UQ are the wave field variables, and they, are, they have to be solved together. Therefore, this equation is also referred to as the coupled VTR system. And uh, we use the uh, notations for the model parameters slightly different from the original paper. And um, um, here we have three dependent model parameters uh, from the top left top left figure, um, the dashed line indicates the symmetry axis, and the V parallel is the uh, quasi P wave velocity along the symmetry axis, and the V perpendicular is the compressional wave velocity uh, in the transverse plane, which is uh, orthogonal to the symmetry axis. So we can think of this uh, uh, couple of the equation as a um, linear operator L applied on the wave field variable UP and the UQ vector. And in the uh, wave field tomography, tomography problem, we need to find the adjoint of this operator, which has been discussed by John yesterday, and in the context of adjoint state method. So the bottom equation is the adjoint of the top one, and the full derivation, you, you can find the full derivation in the CWP report. And um, if, you are, if you have a brave soul, you will also have to uh, consider the boundary conditions. But I will not uh, go too deep into this uh, implementation details, but I do want to draw attention that uh, this uh, adjoint operator, L transports, is quite different from the uh, time reversal propagation, which is a uh, common mistake by many people. And um, the reason is quite simple if you can compare the linear operator L and L transpose. You noted that um, the off diagonal elements of these two operators are interchanged. And further, each element in the L transpose operator, um, you have the velocity scaling applied before the spatial differentiation. 
Now this makes a difference between the uh, time reversal propagation. In the time reversal propagation or the reverse time migration, you always apply the same operator for the forward and backward. This is uh, the same operator for F. But in the adjoint modeling, we are applying F transpose in the adjoint, adjoint uh, sweep. So uh, the bottom line is uh, the adjoint modeling is not simply uh, time reversal propagation. It is time reversal propagation, but not only that, sorry. Um, so another interesting feature of this couple of system is that we have the model parameters in velocity squares. This gives us a hint that uh, we should parameterize our model with velocity squares. Now this um, model parameterization is um, a big issue and has been discussed intensively uh, in literature. When we searched the literature, we found uh, there are mainly three categories of uh, model parameterization for this acoustic media media. You can parameterize the model with uh, three velocities. You can parameterize with two velocities plus one Thomson parameter. You can parameterize uh, with uh, one velocity and plus two Thomson parameter. And you will find these uh, parameterizations uh, in literature and uh, this uh, typical choice made by many people. So you might ask a question, why do we choose the velocity squares? Well, there are two reasons, and I want to explain them in detail. We think uh, choosing these velocity squares as the model parameters has no downside, and we think it has upside. Um, the choosing these uh, velocity squares as model parameters has no downside because we think all existing model parameterizations for this kind of media has two issues. One is uh, the recovery of the model parameters is acquisition dependent. And in other words, we have illumination issue during the inversion. For example, the delta is often not constrained by the surface seismic data. And the, another issue is that uh, when we do the multi-parameter inversion, we will have the model leakage between these models, model parameters. Um, for example, recent studies um, uh, by, our, by our colleague have shown that uh, um, the, their model leakage between the parallel and the VNMO and uh, their trade-offs between VNMO and the perpendicular. So, we conclude that uh, the seismic data alone cannot fully constrain the model parameters. Therefore, choosing, um, no matter what uh, parameterizations we use. So, choosing these uh, velocity squares, we think we have no downside. For, um, I, will back, uh, I will go back to these two issues um, in the later slides. And to address these two issues, we will propose that uh, inequality-based uh, model constraints. And for now, let me explain why choosing these velocity squares have uh, upside. Um, so the rationale is quite simple. We write down the gradient formulas for these uh, parameterizations. Um, then, we, then we check which one is the easiest one to implement. Um, cost a minimum amount of human work. And it turns out that uh, with these velocity squares, our our formulas for the gradient is quite compact. This is basically because uh, the velocity squares is linear in the coupled VTA system. So with the model parameterization, no, uh, we can write down the gradients and easily following the recipes of the uh, adjoint state method. And uh, there are three equations because we have three model parameters, but each of them is quite simple to Im implement. All we need to do is do a form of the modeling to get the state variables, up and uq. Then we do a adjoint modeling to get the uh, adjoint with the variable, ap and aq. Finally, we do a zero lag cross correlation of these wave field variables. And of course, this is for only one shot. We need to sum over all the shots. So let me give you a simple example to say, um, this, this is a three layer model. Um, the top and the bottom layer are the isotropic layers. The middle one is a VTR layer. All these three layers are constant. Um, the values of them are not so important 
here, so I don't show this scale bar. But the important thing is um, we will start our inversion with uh, constant positive perturbations in all three model parameters in the VTI layer. So I put the source on the surface, on the top layer, and the receiver on the bottom. Um, the, uh, the sources are excited uh, simultaneously to uh, simulate the plane wave propagation. Well, this uh, example is uh, designed uh, carefully um, for the reason that will be apparent later. Now let's look at the gradients. This is a gradient I got at the first iteration following the uh, using the formulas I've shown you before. There are two main features of this gradient. First, note that uh, we have a red color gradient for the V parallel sphere. And this red color indicates positive values for that. Um, this is ex expected because we have a positive perturbation on all three model parameters. Then the gradient should be positive because the gradient points to the uphill direction of the mesphere function. Another important feature of this gradient is that we have uh, white colors for these other two model parameters, Vn and V parallel. These white colors indicate zero values on this uh, gradient. Now this is interesting. Uh, we have uh, positive perturbations on these two model parameters, but we get uh, zero update on them. So what's the reason for that? And uh, this is because we are simulating in the plane wave propagation. The plane wave propagates from top to bottom using the velocity of V parallel. So when we record the data on, on the bottom receivers, uh, the wave recorded have no information about the VNMO and the V perpendicular. So we should not expect any sensitivity of these uh, model parameters to the misfit function. Now this is exactly the uh, illumination issue or the acquisition dependent issue we have discussed before. So here's a question, how can we update the two model parameters with the, given the data we have? Well, uh, if the data cannot tell, we think of the model itself. Um, based on, so one possible way is to use the intrinsic model uh, model relations in the petrophysical sense or the rock physical sense. Um, here's the relation we have for this acoustic VTR media. We can relate these um, velocity squares by the Thomson parameters. This is well known. This is by definition. I mean. uh, so a straightforward implementation is uh, we can evaluate, compute the, uh, the values of this uh, VNMO and the V perpendicular based on the, the, uh, the values of the parallel uh, after each iteration. But this will require the exact knowledge of epsilon delta, which we don't know in reality. But we can have uh, pretty good estimates of the range of these values. We can bound this epsilon delta with epsilon min, epsilon max, delta min, delta max. Then we ask ourselves, we have to satisfy these uh, inequalities over the iterations. So, before I uh, tell you how to incorporate these inequality relations in the framework of tomography problem, let's first look at the model space we have, see how these inequality relations can affect our model space. Here's a 3D model space with the three axes of velocity squares one important feature of this uh, model space is that uh, we have uh, the three axes with the same units and uh, they approximately, uh, approximately have the same range. This is another advantage of our choice of uh, velocity squares as the model parameterization. And uh, now let's look at the uh, um, petrophysical relation. This is the equality relation we have before. This the formula shown on the right corresponds to a plane in the 3D model space. And similarly, we can do the same thing for the another formula. Then the inequalities requires, require our model parameters to fall inside these two planes. And this is, um, it has a projection on the plane with uh, shaded by yellow. 
So this is uh, basically for uh, a subspace of the model space, which formed by the two half spaces. And this is only for delta. We can do the same thing to the epsilon. Here's the two. Uh, here's another subspace by epsilon. If we take the intersection of these four planes, we end up with a four phases pyramid. So inside the pyramid, we can satisfy the inequality relations. So the pyramid basically tells us um, our model parameters are feasible only inside this pyramid. Um, so you might notice that uh, we have a huge model space. Then with these inequalities, we can shrink the model space to be a small subspace. That's a cool thing. So, so let's go back to the tomography problem, say how these inequalities can apply. This is the problem I've shown before, the tomography problem. Now we need to add the four inequality constraints, C1 to C4. The red color epsilon delta are the prior information we have. We can estimate from um, scatter plot or, or cross plot uh, of the model parameters. Now the whole thing on this slide is called uh, the inequality constraint optimization um, in the in the optimization community language. Uh, the textbook solution to this kind of a, uh, this kind of a problem is to transform it into an equivalent PD constraint optimization problem. Here we augment the original missive function with additional term. I is the indicate function, indicates whether we, are, we have satisfied our inequality relations or not. If the inequality relations are violated, we add an infinite penalty to the misfit function. Otherwise, it contributes nothing. But notice that this inequality relation, inequality, uh, the indicate function is uh, not differentiable. We need to evaluate its gradient, right? So one possible way is to approximate with some um, logarithmic function. This is called the logarithmic barrier method. So notice that uh, there's a controlling parameter t here. The values of t are a uh, subject, subjective choice and is um, problem dependent. So for a given t, we can solve the um, PD constrained optimization problem to get a suboptimal solution. And uh, this optimum, this is called the centering process of this logarithmic barrier method. There are the theorem to prove that uh, this suboptimal solution converges to the optimal solution of the original problem. Uh, if we solve a sequence of uh, this uh, PD constrained optimization problem, for t goes from small to large, but this is too costly. We cannot afford that because each of these PD constraint optimization problem is a tomography problem. So. In our implementation, we fix the value of t throughout the iterations. Now let's go back to the original example to see how these inequality constraints can help. This is the model I've shown you before. And this is the without constraints. You have seen that. And if we add the constraints, we get this gradient at the first iteration. Now I'm going to go back and forth once. Now, so there are two main differences. First, to note the color of the uh, gradients for v parallel square has changed. The color indicates the direction of the gradient. So we basically changed the direction of the gradient. This is because we have now two terms of the missing function. One is the data misfit, one is the uh, penalty from the inequality constraints. So the data misfit and the inequality constraints Basically, one uh, update the model in the opposite direction. And in this case, the inequality constraint dominates. There's uh, another feature of these gradients. We have non-zero values for the other two model parameters. And this is exactly what we want. So uh, we can uh, look at the values of the model parameters. And uh, this can help us to understand how the inversion goes. So we check, since this is a constant VDL layer, we can only check the center of the model and see how the values change over iterations. Um, 
So we start from the black dots, the background model denoted uh, as the black dots. The value is shown here. And uh, our objective of the, uh, the wave field tomography problem is to find a path to reach the red dot, which is the true model. So we do 30 conjugate gradient iterations without the inequality constraints. Um, the right figure shows the uh, data misfit function changes over iterations. So when I iterate, you will see the misfit function decreases over iterations. And uh, at the same time, you see the values of the model parameters um, move along certain paths in the model space. So in this case, the blue dot on the left figure showed the values of them. And you notice that uh, basically the blue dot starts from the black dot and uh, moves uh, along the direction parallel to the axis of the parallel square. So this basically tells us uh, we are only updating the velocity of uh, be parallel. And this is exactly what you see from the gradients. So if we, um, so although this uh, misfit function is decreasing, we cannot update the other two model parameters. So now, as a comparison, we can go 30 conjugate gradient iterations to see how these inequality constraints can help. So the middle figure shows the, again, shows the data misfit function changes over iteration and the right figure show the sum of data misfit and the e penalty from inequality constraints change over iteration. The left figure is the model space where we will see the model values change over iteration. So when I go iterations, we see the we see the sum of the, the total misfit function decreases over iterations. However, you notice the data method function increases somehow. And you start to increase it at the beginning and then decrease at some point. So uh, after about 15 iterations, you noted the green dot on shown on the left figure. We are pretty close to the true model. Wow, this is exciting. And um, noted that this green dot take a totally different um, Plus from the from the one shown without the inequality constraints. But if we go ahead with the iterations, with 30 iterations, we see the the model values deviate from the true model. This looks weird, but uh, actually this is expected. There are two reasons for that. First, notice the total misfit function has not reached the zero, so we have not converted yet. The another reason is that, as I said before, we fixed the value of controlling parameter t in, in the context of a logarithmic barrier method. So uh, we are actually solving a different optimization problem from the original one. So, so the solution we get from this kind of problem should not be the one with the true solution, right? And um, the theory tells us we need to solve a sequence of uh, such optimization problem to convert to the red dot, which is the true model. And uh, this is an undergoing research, and uh, we hope to address uh, in the next stage. So here I plot the two paths together. The blue dot is, the, is without inequality constraints. The green dot is uh, with inequality constraints. Clearly we can uh, obtain um, better model updates, model, uh, we can recover the model parameters better with these uh, inequality constraints, especially for these uh, insensitive model parameters. In this case, VNMO and the V perpendicular. So in this presentation, uh, we discuss the pseudo-acoustic wave field tomography using the coupled VTI wave equations. And we parameterize the model with uh, three velocity squares. So uh, based on the criteria of convenience in terms of uh, implementation level. And we think uh, just as other model parameterizations do, our choice has um, the, uh, the issues of uh, acquisition dependent, elimination issue, and uh, model leakage issue. So we therefore propose to uh, 
use the uh, model constraints based on the petrophysical sense. And these, their relations are formulated as inequalities. So uh, incorporating these inequality constraints, we can resolve the insensitive, insensitive model parameters. And we think our method is quite flexible in the sense that uh, we only need to estimate the range of model parameters, not the exact value of the model parameters. And uh, we can easily extend this idea to other multi-parameter inversions as long as these model parameters have uh, intrinsic relations. And uh, moreover, our method is quite efficient. You just add additional term to that misfit function. So, and uh, this uh, inequality constraints can further help stabilize the wave propagation using this uh, coupled VTI wave equations because this is an issue involved uh, with uh, the acoustic and the assumption. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening and uh, be happy to answer questions. Thank you.